Father, once again, we just bless you for Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for this champion. He is Lord. He is God. Thank you for the saints of God, for the worship of your, your people. You're so worthy of this. I invite you, Lord, once again to open our eyes to the scriptures. Give us, we pray, light. Change us because of our time in your presence. In the name of our wonderful Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we're in chapter 14. Yes, sir. <laughs> Which means we've been in chapter 13 and chapter 12. What, what do we learn from this? Um, one of the things we learn is that God's word has depth. There's, there's depth here, and it, it, it really exceeds us. It's, it's beyond us. It's what I, what I find amazing. What I find amazing is we could start this series, 1 Corinthians, all over again next year and come up with something new. <laughs> we read through the Bible prayerfully. That's what you're doing. You're reading through the Bible in a year. We read through it daily and constantly the Spirit of God is just challenging and bringing things, insights and sensibilities, creating a sensitivity, I should say, to his word. With that, I, I know it's difficult to, and I want to acknowledge, it's, it's the difficulty of, of, of following a systematic study of scripture. What is systematic? Systematic is, in fact, what we have in the Bible. We have the Bible. It, it is a, a systematic book. How do we know that? It's Old Testament. What? New Testament. We have a beginning, and we have what? An ending. All, all of the, the, um, the, the structure of the scripture uh, reveals a systematic or system. And, and so to derive, to gain the, the best understanding of scripture, the best approach for the study of scripture is a systematic approach rather than a helter skelter of you know just yes, popping all over the place what i what i hope to achieve in in my uh, journey and in my um, stint as as the uh, pastor here pastor teacher as a pastor teacher what i hope to achieve here is to develop help you all to develop a greater appreciation again for the scriptures and that by the time i have moved on I've, um, you know, going into God's presence that you will have a better, more fuller understanding of the fullness of Scripture um, so that you'll better understand the Word of God. So we, we've spent a number of months, we've spent a number of years in the book of 1 Corinthians. Those of you, uh, you who are perhaps visiting with us, um, we have been in 1 Corinthians since... I came here. Yes, sir. I don't know if you all realize that. <laughs> Thank you, Deacon Garris. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We have been in this book since I, I came here, and that's uh, 2006. And, and uh, many, many perhaps are wondering why are we spending so much time in this one book of Scripture? Um, well, the, the whole idea is, again, to give you a, as, as best as I can, to give you an understanding of what the book of 1 Corinthians is all about. And 
to give it its value and its worth, far be it from me to speedily race, race through any, any passage, any book. I hope that, if anything, you take away from this study that in order to gain an understanding of Scripture, you've got you've to set your, your, your tent up. Your, you've got to yes, make a camp. You've got to camp out. Yes, that you will not gain what God has for you in, this, in, the, in the Word of God if you are not ready to spend some quality time in studying the word of God. And so a verse-by-verse verse study of the scriptures is, I think, in fact, I think it's the only way to preach the word of God and, and be, be, be faithful to the mind of the spirit. Yes, sir. If, think, think what I'm saying here. <laughs> this is the inspired word of God. Yes. Every word, every verse yes. is the mind of God. How could I just take chunks of it and not give you the, the, in fact, Jesus said, Jesus said that the word of God is inspired down to the smallest letter, the youth. So it behooves us as, as um, students of scripture to, to gain the, the fullness of, of its meaning. And so systematic Bible study d does require this type of, of um, longevity it does it really does and I, I really appreciate your patience with me I appreciate your encouragement I appreciate the, the fact that you um, um, as, as Paul said you are sent by by amens your, your amens all of that says that uh, you you, uh, you value what God says and may, may God continue to bless us in in this journey and thank you so much for, your, for being there. You, you could vote with your feet. <laughs> you, you could be sitting up under another, in another church. But, but you're here, and I, I do thank you for that. Truly appreciate you for that. Um, and, and I realize, too, you're not here for me. I know that. You're here for him. Therefore, therefore, I owe you. I owe you. This, this is a debt. I owe you. I'm paying my debt. And, and today is just another installment on a debt that I owe you. I owe you a clear understanding of what God has said. And, and if I fail there, if I fail there, then I have truly failed. Because that, that's, my, that's my, my responsibility to you. And I, I want to go into the presence of God having um, just... I really do. I want to hear him say, well done. Yes, sir. Well done. And, and so that's, that's my pursuit. And it, it, might, um, it might create a, 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 you know, an uncomfortable level. Of, because this is, um, I, this is different. I, I realize, you know, Pastor Brown, he had one approach. And, and I thank God for Pastor Brown. I, I truly appreciate him. And he, he was a tremendous bulwark in my own life. But I just want to share with you, I, I'm not Pastor Brown. I'm, you've noticed that. Um, and I can't do what he did. I can't fill his shoes. And so I, I'm here to, to do what David Gaines can do. And, and, and so it's, it's not all that it could be because I, I don't think any preacher, if, if, we're, if, we're, if we're honest and faithful, no, no one man can be all in all. There is only one all in all. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So uh, what, what one style, one other pastor might have and in terms of a different style, a different way, a different approach, I, I don't know. I, I just refuse to envy. I refuse to compare. I just want to get so immersed and entrenched in, in what he has said. Yes, sir. Because I think what he has said makes more difference in my life and in your life than anything I can come up with. It's, it's what God has said. And in fact, that takes me to the text. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'm starting at verse 16. I'm sorry, verse 18. Forgive me. Paul says, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding so that I may teach others also. 
than 10,000 words in an unknown time. Paul's concern is for the church when it gathers. Yet in the church, verse 19 says, in the church. Clearly what Paul wants in the church is that the body gain understanding. Look at the passage. Look at it. Paul says, yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also, rather than ten words in an unknown tongue that we don't understand. So what is, what is Paul's emphasis? In fact, you know what I did? In reading the scripture, every, every week I'm, I'm reading through 1 Corinthians, just reading through, just continuing to saturate myself with the mind of, of the writer, the spirit of God, what he's saying. And as I'm reading, one of the things I noted, we talked about this in Sunday school. In Sunday school, when, when we're uh, studying scripture, uh, it's called the, um, the uh, science of hermeneutics, biblical um, approach to interpreting scripture, how to interpret scripture. It's, it's called hermeneutics, simply means how to interpret. One of the things, uh, there are these uh, principles of interpretation, and our approach to Scripture is that we, we come to the interpretation of Scripture from a literal standpoint. We, we don't try to uh, spiritualize, allegorize the passages of Scripture. What God said is what he meant. So it's incumbent, it's necessary that we discover, find out what he said and the meaning of the word. So we approach it literally. We approach it historically. We go back. We do our best to, to look at historical references that bring um, old light to our world today. So that when we're looking at, at Paul writing to the Corinthians, we need to get the light of, 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 of the history from that age, from that time when Paul wrote in the first century. And we want to bring, we want to export that light, that history, that stuff we want to export it to our day, to our understanding, so we can understand the scripture. That's a historical approach. But we also want to look at, let, look at the context. Yes, sir. The context. And, and we look at grammar. We look at words. Yes. And, and as we're looking at words, then we, we begin to uh, synthesize. Because we believe that God's word is one coherent unit. That um, it, it's, it's not... Um, multiple pieces that are not connected. It, it's one. The Word of God is one. And, and Old Testament supports new, new supports old. Yeah. Prophets do not contradict each other. So when people tell you the Bible does, contradicts itself, they're, they don't know, they're, they're telling you one of, one of two things, maybe one of three. They're either lying or they're ignorant and, and they haven't read the Word of God. Or they're just saying what they've heard other people say. Other people have said the Bible contradicts. Neither is true. The word of God does not contradict itself. Amen. The spirit of God is the author. He does not contradict. Amen. So what we believe is that the word of God is a coherent unit. Yes. In that, what we do, we, we attempt in our study of the scripture to become what we call, as I shared in the Sunday school, CSI agents. Yeah. Um, that's right. We, we want to be... Um, crime scene, but this is, we're not investigating a crime, okay? There was no crime here. But let, let's call ourselves um, WSI. What's that? Word scene investigators. What do we want to do? As, a, as an investigator of the word, what we want to do is, is, is rope off the area and make sure we're not tracking into the text stuff that doesn't belong there. So what do we, what do we want to do? We, we want to notice stuff. We want to come with our magnifying glass. We want to come with our dictionaries. We want to come with our historical references. We want to come with all of the tools that help us to understand this passage. One of the things I did in, in um, preparing for today's uh, message, I counted the number of times Paul used the word understanding in chapter 14. Do you know that he used the word understanding nine times? In fact, that's the one word that was used more than any other word in chapter 14. Aside from the ifs, the it, 
the thes. I'm talking word. Nine times. This, this significant word was used nine times. The concept of understanding, knowing, that, that concept of knowing, it, it's used five, there was an additional five to six times where, where Paul um, used this concept of, of knowledge and knowing and hearing and un, the concept of comprehension. So if I were to ask you, what is chapter 14 about? What is it about? Thank you. <laughs> when we gather, what's important is that we what? Understand. That's why, that's why I labor. That's my responsibility, to help you to understand the text. That's what transforms us, understanding and applying the word of God. Paul used the word understanding nine times. Listen to this. He says, I would rather speak just five words so that you can understand them. The benefit of understanding far outweighs um, profound um, verbo verboseness. What is verbose? Words, just wordy, word, just, just words, just words. See, five words, if people understanding, would, are, are far more important and vital and significant than a bunch of words people don't understand. Verse 20, Paul says, brothers, do not be children in understanding. <laughs> That's the eighth time. The ninth time is in verse 20 again. However, in malice, be babes. Be like babies in, in, in malice, in in, in terms of your relationship. Don't carry attitudes, adult attitudes of bitterness and anger. But be a baby. Babies don't hold grudges. But in understanding, be mature. Don't be a baby in understanding. And I think it's rather interesting that he, he uses this concept of understanding once again as it relates to this issue of tongues. And, and he uses the principle of uh, or this idea of, of babies and maturity when it comes to this idea of tongues. Tongues back then, as well as today, creates for people in, when the church gathers a, a, a phenomena of, of um, sensationalism. It draws attention to the person who is speaking in an unknown tongue. It draws attention on the one sense what is he saying? Which means if, he's, if, if we're taking our attention and placing it on someone who's speaking and you don't know what he's saying, what it lends itself to is what? Not understanding. And, and Paul says this, this I, I believe the implication here is when he's saying in verse 20, don't be babies when it comes to understanding. Grow up. We, we, many, many churches are, are, um, are, are just um, nurseries. And I, I don't say that as a pejorative to, to make fun of, but I say it because they're, they're, they're encouraging immaturity in, in stuff that has no credibility because it does not lend itself to what? Understanding. Paul says, look, now, now this, this is, this is what, what I really, I find uh, really amazing about Paul. Paul is, is a, uh, just an excellent communicator, wonderful communicator. Yeah. Um, he, it, look, look at, look at this, this uh, text. He says, in the law, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all of that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. And then he says, therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who are believers, but to unbelievers. Prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. 
Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. He is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God truly is among you. Paul is a, just, an, just an excellent communicator. And what, what he does here, this phrase, it is written is Paul's attempt to, now when I say attempt, I don't mean he tried it and failed, but he's, what, what he's done here is he is leveraging. He is leveraging the authority and the power of the word, Old Testament, he calls it what? The law. In the law it is written. He is leveraging what God has said in his word in the Old Testament and using its authority and power in his his debate or in his argument. He's he's using not not his own authority, but the authority of the word. So what what is he doing? He's doing what, what, um, and, and this is synthesis. What is he doing? He's synthesizing. He's going back to the Old Testament, taking Old Testament and and bringing it to his uh, contemporary audience. So he's leveraging the power of what was said in the Old Testament to apply it to this problem of tongues. I want to take you to another passage. Look at Matthew 4, and I want you to see this same principle of leveraging. Look at Matthew chapter 4. Jesus used this, this principle. And we'll go back to 1 Corinthians. Everyone there? Look at um, Matthew chapter 4. And I, I want you to find these words. In verse 3, now when the tempter, when the devil came to him, that is to Jesus, the devil said, if you are the son of God, or in some translations, since you are, it's a subjunctive there, and we'll talk about that another day, but um, the idea is, is that Satan is trying to challenge Jesus, tempt him. And he says, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So what, what is he doing? In order to deal with temptation, Jesus leverages the authority of the word. Old Testament to help him to overcome the temptation that he faces in the devil. Amen. Look, look, he does it again. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. And look at this. Look at, look at this. Look at this. Look, look at this devil. Ooh, look at this devil. You, you know what devil is? It's, it's the word diabolos. D- to be a diabolical, uh, the word, uh, forgive me, a devil, this adversary. And as a diabolical adversary, what is he trying to do? He try- he's trying to separate Jesus from truth. See, that's diabolical. That's strategic. That's planning. And how does he do it? Wouldn't you know? He's trying to imitate Jesus. Look at this. He said, cast yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written. (laughs) Look at this devil. This is amazing. What does the devil do? 
See, he, he, he says, all right, so you want, you, want to, you, want to, you want to leverage. You want to play the leverage game. I can do that, the devil said. He says, throw yourself down, for it is written. He's trying to leverage the scripture to abuse the scripture to get Jesus to do something stupid. Jesus responds how? Jesus said to him, it is written again. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. What, what is, what, what's going on here in this, this exchange? The, the devil is trying to leverage the word of God to misuse it and abuse it, which illustrates a, 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 just a huge point here. That this book is, is truth. And, and it can be abused and misused. Sometimes intentionally, as in the case of the devil, and sometimes in ignorance. The devil is doing it intentionally, trying to abuse the scripture and leverage the authority to try and get Jesus to succumb to temptation. Amen. Jesus counters, responds by properly quoting scripture. He says it is written again. So what is Jesus doing? Jesus is leveraging the scripture because when he says it is written, he's depending on the power and the authority of the word. Now imagine this. This is Jesus, God, the son, in flesh. He could look at the devil and send him to an early hell in a word. He, he could have done that. Could have done that. But he didn't. He did not use his divine authority and power to encounter the devil. That day is coming. But not, not today in Matthew 4. That wasn't the day. So what he demonstrates is an incredible sense of patience. And instead of using divine power, what he uses... He uses his human faculties, but he captures the authority of the word of God and leverages the authority of the word and applies it to this situation. What does it illustrate? Beloved, if you want to win in temptation and trials, you need to leverage the scriptures. You, you need to get the word of God in, in your spirit and soul. Now, what's amazing? is the devil, the devil. You know what he did not have? You know what he didn't? See, look, look at the text. Look at the text. It says, the devil said, throw yourself down, for it is written. Now, I'm wondering, do you think he had a copy of the scroll? That he, he, turned, he turned to the scroll where it is written and began reading. That devil didn't do that. No. You know what the devil did and does? He memorizes the scripture. Yes, sir. I find that amazing. Yes. He quoted the word of God yes. as the devil. Jesus quotes it as the God man. <laughs> to, 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 to bounce him back. To get him up off you, beloved. You got to get in the book. Now you, you can, you can, you can, uh, you, you, you can try and do this stuff if you want. Yes. Loose here, Satan. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 you can try that stuff if you want. That ain't going nowhere. What's interesting, what's interesting is that each time the devil came to him, Jesus quoted scripture. And the Bible says that the devil left him. Left him. He's not, beloved, the devil is not afraid of you. But when you quote scripture, see, what you're bringing to bear is not your authority. You have no authority to, to order him to do anything. Amen. But beloved, when you rightly handle the word, the word puts him in place. Yes, the authority of the scripture puts him in place, sends him away. What is he doing? He is leveraging the power and the authority of the word of God. 
Paul did the same thing. Look, look, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We've got a huge problem, he says, in, in, in the Corinthian church. Huge problem. What? We've got folk in, in, in the Corinthian church who are talking stuff that no one knows what in the world is going on. And all it's doing is causing a lot of confusion, division, and strife, and turmoil. And when we come together, we can't even unify ourselves in worship. Why? Because of all of this mayhem going on. That's what was going on in the Corinthian church. So what does Paul do? Does he try to? You know what he does? Now, now Paul, as, as the consummate, the consummate uh, um, negotiator or the consummate communicator, you know what he does? Paul uses his extraordinary reasoning. First, he illustrates why tongues naturally, unknown tongues naturally, are, don't belong in, 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 the, in the body. How does he do it? He uses this, this concept. Look, look with me in, in verse 8, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 8. He says, the trumpet, the trumpet, the flute, the, the harp, if, if they pipe a sound that, that people don't understand, then it's going to what? If, how will it be known what is piped or played? See, he uses what is natural, what is natural reasoning to say what? Unknown tongues, they don't fit in here. Trumpets, trumpets need to blow a distinct sound. Not only does he use the trumpet, but then in verse, look at verse, verse uh, 10. He says, human language. Look, look at this, verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Every language, every human language you know has some significance. So what is he doing? He's using his, his incredible ability to reason. And, and this, this reasoning power just, just is phenomenal. He, he uses what, what's called syllogism in his argument. I, I want you to see that. I want you to see that, the syllogism. See, the syllogism is made up of, of uh, three components of, of, of a statement, what's called the apotesis, the protesis, and the conclusion. Now, now just follow me, follow me. If, if it weren't in the scripture, I wouldn't be talking this morning about syllogism. <laughs> but it's in the text. <laughs> Paul is using this, 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 art, this ability to, to argue, and it, it, it's, it's set like this. The major thesis, the minor support or subordinate part of that uh, clause, and then the conclusion. It goes like this. If this is true, then this must be true. Therefore, Look, look at how he does this. Look at this. Look. If, then, therefore. Watch this. Look. Look at verse 6. Paul says, but now, brothers, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? See, that's, that's the, the introductory statement to his, to his reasoning. If I come to you speaking with tongues, how will I profit you? See, the major question here is how do tongues profit the body. That's it. That's the major. Um, and, and so he's using all of his reasoning faculties to bring that to bear in his ability to convince them that tongues, unknown tongues, don't belong in, in the church. If I come to you speaking with tongues, how will it profit you? Look, look, look. Then he goes, look at uh, verse 9. So likewise unless you utter by the tongue words to understand how will it known what is spoken. Now that's, that's the, the middle clause, the subordinate clause, but look at, look at how he concludes it. Look, look at this. Watch this. Look, look at verse 11. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner. He does this so many times throughout 1 Corinthians 14. What? If, then, therefore. Go back with me now to verse 21. He used his, his reasoning, his power to reason, but now he sets that aside. <laughs> he sets aside his human ability to reason in order to fix this problem. So now what does he use? He uses scripture. See, the scripture is like the... the uh, the, the, the scud missile. <laughs> it's when, 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 when you're trying to take your enemy out, use a scud. 
the stealth, the stealth, use it and, and, and take them out. See, th- this, is, this is the final blow, as it were. He used his, his reasoning, his human reasoning, but now he's using scripture. In the law, it is written. What is he doing? He's leveraging the authority of the word in this argument. And so what does he do? He goes back to the Old Testament. Come on. Real quickly, I want to take you to Isaiah. Keep your finger here. Isaiah chapter 28. He goes back to Isaiah chapter 28. And says, quotes Isaiah. In the law, it is written. Now, now by the way, Isaiah is not technically part of what's called the Pentateuch, the Torah. But Paul uses the word law as a, um, uh, almost like a euphemism to, to, um, to speak about the entire book of the Old Testament in the law as a reference to the entire um, writings of, of the Old Testament because the law being the greater, all Jews knew about the law, it being the greater of the writings, so he uses the authority of the law and, and just uh, categorizes all of the writings, even Isaiah, as, as part of the law. So he says, in the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. And yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. So he quotes this passage out of Isaiah 28. So you're with me in Isaiah 28. Look at this. And... And you know what? I'm not going to be able to finish this today, but I, I want to at least give a, you know, a down payment. Look at verse 7. Um, here in, in Isaiah, let, let me just give you some background to what's going on here in Isaiah. Isaiah is, is writing, this prophet is writing to the people of Judah, um, of Israel, and, and they are wayward. And they're wayward because of their leaders. They're wayward um, because, uh, in fact, look, look with me at verse 7. Look at this. But they also have erred through wine and through intoxicating drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are all out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision. They stumble in their judgment. Who? The prophets and the priests are erring because they're drinking. They're drunks. (laughs) So if you've got preachers, priests, prophets, drunks, what do you suppose is happening to the people? If you've got leaders drunk, what's happening to those who are following? Drunk. They, 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 there was no leadership there. There was no covering for the nation of Israel. Isaiah challenges these people, challenges them, particularly the leadership, the, the priests. The priests and the prophets have erred. Now, now I, want, I want to tell you, when, when, you, when we're drinking, you, you're not going to understand the word of God. Amen. You're not going to understand it. And, and so these men are trying to teach the word of God while they're drunk. They're swallowed up. They're controlled by their wine through intoxicating drink. And they err in their vision and they stumble in their judgment. Look, verse 8. For all... The tables are full of vomit and filth. No place is clean. Imagine this. They're so drunk that they're vomiting all over the place. You know what? I, I, I'm glad I, I'm reading this because if I told you this, you wouldn't believe it. That you mean this is in God's word that men get so drunk, priests, prophets got so drunk that they're vomiting all over the tables. That's sickening. That's disgusting. And yet it's right there in the text. It's right there in the text. Illustrating for us what? 
that they, they were uncontrolled. And yet in this, in this state, in this state of drunkenness, in this drunken stupor, look, in verse 9, they say, whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk, babies. Those just drawn from breast. For precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. What's, what's going on? These drunken priests and prophets are tired of Isaiah. The tide of Isaiah, the tide of his preaching. And I, I pray that that's not. <laughs> I had to say that. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but um, they, they were tired of his preaching. And, 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 and they, they were so tired that they're mocking him. Listen, as they mock him, look, look at this. The tide of God and the tide of, of Isaiah in his preaching. Who will he teach? Now who is he going to teach and make to understand the message? So, they're, they're, I mean, this is real palpable mocking. Will it be the babes that are just coming off milk or drawn from the breast? Every time he, he gets up there, precept upon precept. Now imagine Isaiah the prophet, what is, he, what is he preaching from? He's preaching from the Old Testament, probably the law, to try and give them instructions. He's probably quoting uh, Moses in the law, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Numbers, Exodus. He's probably quoting them. And their response to his usage of the Old Testament, leveraging the Old Testament, is what? Precept upon precept, line upon line, there a lot of there. They're, they're, they're upset with him and they're mocking. They're mocking the man of God. You know what? Preaching is a tough job. It is. And, and uh, I mean, if you're going to do it, and do it right. And, and I, I thank God, too, that you, you wouldn't allow me to do anything but that. I, I really do. I, I, I just believe that. If, if I went astray, that you, the corporate body, would, would, uh, would, would grab me by my collar. I, I just believe that. I just believe that that's just because, amen, that, that, that's the, the quality and the integrity of, of ministry here at Man of Bible. Thanks be again to um, uh, its founder. But, but here in, it, it, with, with the people of Judah, they had gotten so tired of, of Isaiah and said, look, and they mocked him. They made fun of him. But listen, God was listening. Look at this. Look at this. In verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was to them. Precept upon precept, line upon line, precept here a little, there a little. God says, look, I want to refresh you. I want to renew you. I want to give you rest. Yeah, right. Precept of more stuff, more precept, more line upon line. In verse 11, God says to them, okay, if you won't hear Isaiah, as he's teaching you with words you can understand. Verse 11, God says, For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. What is he saying? Okay, you don't, you don't want to hear the word? What you can understand? In the simplicity of, of, of the law, you don't want to understand that? Don't want it? You're, you're tired of that? I'll tell you what. How about if I send men whose lips will stammer and speak a language that you don't understand? Now God mocks them. How? Oh, they mocked him. Precept upon precept, line upon line. Well, God now mocks them and says, all right, I got, I got, I got something for you. <laughs> you don't like my word? Then, then let, me, let me do this for you. I'm going to send you someplace where you won't understand. 
the language. What does he do? What he did for Assyria, he sent the Assyrians to a land that they did not understand. <laughs> they didn't understand. He sent, he sent uh, Judah and in, into what? Babylon, captivity. So that they, they did not understand the Babylonians. God mocked them, put it right back at them. If you don't want to understand the truth, you mock truth, then let me send you a tongue that you don't understand. What Paul is doing, he's leveraging what God did in Judah. He sent unknown tongues to them they did not understand as a judgment against the nation of Israel. When God judged Israel, part of the judgment was to send them to a foreign land so that they're exposed to foreigners and they're speaking language in a culture that they have no clue what's going on. Can you imagine what it's like to be in a foreign land and you're, you're the people who, who are oppressing you are talking in languages that you don't understand? They were humiliated but they were being judged by God. In Paul's thinking, I'm back in 1 Corinthians, Paul's thinking is this. Paul says, with men it is written in the law, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all of that they will not hear me. God, God sent them to a foreign land, but they still wouldn't listen. Look at verse 22. What is this? Paul's reasoning. Look at this. If, then, therefore. Look, he says, therefore, what? Tongues are for a sign. Not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. What is he doing? He's leveraging the Old Testament and the illustration of how God used Old Testament foreign tongues, foreign language to illustrate his judgment of Israel. Foreign tongues, unknown tongues, is a judgment against the people of God. Paul says it doesn't belong in the body of believers. Look at the text. Therefore, tongues are for a sign not to those who believe, but to what? Unbelievers. So, what, what do we do with, with these, this profound amount of information Paul is, is giving to us about unknown tongues, he draws conclusions. And, and we're going to finish that up, on Lord willing, on next week. But the, the, the point um, I, I want to leave with you today again is that when, when we gather, when we come together, it ultimately is about the worship of God and understanding what we're doing, understanding what we're saying. Paul says, if I pray, I'm going to pray in the Spirit but I'm also going to pray with my understanding. So we don't want to be singing and praying in words that we don't understand. And, and what if that happens, beloved, in our, in our midst, I, I don't want you standing around marveling at that. Oh, wow, that's, that's amazing. No, it's not. It's nonsense. Amen. If you don't understand, it, 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 it does not belong in the body. Understanding is critical to the integrity of, of this body and our, and our growth. And, and so may God bless you as, as we seek again to um, 